Ship show. Well, the dollar index traded below 94 for a good part of the day, but it did manage to close up at 94 even, down just 20 cents. And this followed through with declines that we had on Friday. Gold was up another $19, almost back up at 1260. Silver, though, really shined brightly today, up 54 cents, just below $16 an ounce. The mining stocks, of course, were on fire. The GDX was up just under 6% on the day. The juniors, GDXJ, up just under 7%. And this followed a spectacular day for the mining stocks on Friday. In fact, even though gold itself was down a couple of bucks, we had a huge update in the gold stocks. In fact, between Friday and today, I think this is the two biggest back-to-back gains in the gold stocks all year. And I think the catalyst for this was the downgrade in the first quarter GDP estimates from the Atlanta Fed, among other uh, organizations that follow this, all the way down to just point one. Now, if you remember from listening to my podcasts, the very first time the Atlanta Fed came out with its upward revision with a lot of fanfare, where they were saying 2.7% economic growth for the first quarter, I said that that was all political. It was a bunch of nonsense that uh, Janet Yellen and her cronies got their minds right over there, uh, Cool Hand Luke style, at the Atlanta Fed, and got those guys to come out with a bullish forecast. I said at the time that they were going to have to walk that down all quarter long, and you know what? Now they've uh, eliminated the entire gain. When you're down to just point one, and I think they did that politically. I mean, I think you know, a fair estimate might have been negative 0.1, but they wanted to maintain some semblance there because you still got Barack Obama. I saw him on television just yesterday, again, saying that we have the strongest advanced economy in the world. Now, I don't know. I guess it depends on what the meaning of advanced is or what the meaning of strong is. I don't know. I don't know how you have to define those words to claim that we've got the strongest because we might have one of the weakest economies of the advanced economies. It's just that nobody wants to accept that fact yet. And here's where it really gets interesting, because I was listening this morning again on CNBC where they were very dismissive of the weakness because, of course, they thought it was strong, yet they were very happy to look at the 2.7 percent estimates and they thought that was great. But now they can completely dismiss the lower estimates. And here's what they're saying. They're saying that, well, you know, the last two years, this is exactly how it was. We had very weak first quarters, and then we had big rebounds in the second and third quarter. So they said the same thing is going to happen this year. No, it's not. This year is extremely different uh, from last year. First off, let's talk about the inventories. Because this is the number that came out on Friday that really prompted the Fed to go from, you know, 0.4 to 0.1, right? And so if you look at the inventories, uh, these are wholesale trade inventories for February and January, the first two months of the year. They originally reported the January inventories as up 0.3. And inventories, when companies are buying more inventory, if that's why the inventories are building, not because there's no sales, which we don't have that either, but if companies are buying inventory, then that is a positive into the calculation of GDP. So that number was originally reported as point up 0.3, and they were expecting February to be down 0.2. Instead, they revised the original up 0.3 to down 0.2, down 0.2. And the February number, instead of being down 0.2, was down 0.5. But instead of being down 0.2 from up 0.3, it was down 0.5 from down 0.2. So this is a disaster for January and February. Now, the only reason the inventory to sales ratio went down to 1.36 is because they revised January up from 1.35, which was the highest since 2009, to 1.37. And so now it's down from the 1.37, but it's up from the 1.35 that everybody thought we had. Uh, based on the January numbers. So 1.36 is a huge number. So here is a big difference between Q2 of this year, which is just starting, and Q2 of 2015 and 2014. Companies were still dumb enough to build up their inventories last year because they were still dumb enough to believe in this phony recovery. So they were stockpiling uh, merchandise. 
Now that merchandise is gathering dust on the shelves because their customers are too broke to buy it. So the inventory unwind that I have been talking about for the last year is just beginning. It started in the first quarter of this year, but it's going to gather momentum in the second quarter and the third quarter. So instead of an inventory build adding to GDP like it did in the prior two years, this inventory sell down is going to subtract from GDP. So that is a headwind that used to be a tailwind. Here's another factor, the weather. Now, the last two first quarters were very cold. We had very bad winters. As a result of that, some of the activity that would have normally taken place in the first quarter didn't take place in the first quarter. It took place in the second quarter. So that activity that was pushed forward, right, helped out the second quarter. It helped the economy rebound from a weak first quarter. And a lot of people were talking about that. They were blaming the economic weakness on the cold weather. And, and so we did get a rebound. And of course, when you know they talked about the rebound, they also didn't say, well, it's because of the weather. They tried to claim that the rebound was more legitimate when it really was more of a holdover of the activity that had been pushed forward. But that's not what's happening this year. The first quarter of this year was the warmest first quarter in over 120 years. <laughs> so obviously there is no activity that was pushed forward by the weather. If anything, it might have been pulled forward. Rather, it wasn't pushed backward. It was pulled forward. I think that we had such a warm winter that maybe some of the activity that would have happened in April happened in March instead because it was so warm. So in other words, as weak as the first quarter was, it might have been weaker had we not borrowed some of the activity for the second quarter. So now, instead of the second quarter getting a kickstart from all that activity that was pushed forward, it's actually going to suffer from activity that was pulled forward into the first quarter. Matter? So you get what I'm saying? The second quarter is going to suffer from the weather, whereas the second quarter of 2015 benefited. So that is another key difference. And I think the third difference is the trade deficit, which is rapidly growing this year. And so I think the trade deficit is going to keep on getting bigger, and that is going to be a drag on second quarter GDP. The inventory liquidation is going to continue. That is going to be a drag on second quarter GDP. And the weather effect is going to be a drag on Q2 because some of the activity that normally would have taken place in Q2 took place in, in Q1. And what that really means is had the government properly seasonally adjusted the first quarter for the unusually warm weather, I think the first quarter GDP would be a lot lower. So if we're going to get 0.1 or most likely some negative number, even with all the stuff that the first quarter had going for it weather-wise, can you imagine how bad the first quarter would have been had it been another cold winter? Right? But nobody is talking about this. All they're talking about is, oh, we're going to get the rebound that we got last year. No, we're not. This is completely different than last year. This year isn't like last year at all. If anything, it's the opposite. We're going to get we're going to get the stronger GDP number in the first quarter, and it's going to be all downhill from there. The problem is we're not starting on a very big hill. The first quarter of this year is going to be pathetically low GDP, if not a contraction, and then we're going to fall from there. Which means, if I'm right, if the first quarter is the best quarter and the second and third quarter are weaker, then we are in a recession. And that recession may be started in the fourth quarter of last year. We'll see if they end up revising that number. I think they're going to. Or it began sometime in the first quarter. But either way, I was correct. Because earlier this year, I said we were in a recession. And whether that recession started at the end of last year or the beginning of this year, we were still there. The only question is, when are they going to date the beginning of the recession? Now, I have no idea when this recession is going to end because I think it's going to be longer in duration than the recession that preceded it. Now, the question is, what is the government going to do about it? What is the Federal Reserve going to do about it? Apparently, there was some kind of secret meeting call today uh, between President Obama, Joe Biden, and Janet Yellen, right? And these three uh, geniuses are going to be discussing uh, the economy and, uh, you know, the global economy. I think what they're doing is this is desperation time. They're looking for an excuse.
You see, what they have to do is they got to figure out how to save this economy, how to throw it a lifeline without admitting that it's drowning, right? Because the president wants to pretend it's so strong, yet how can the Fed rescue it uh, with a rate cut? Although the first thing that they can do is just signal that they're not going to raise rates, right? They got to change their forward guidance. They just can't not raise them because, you know, then you still have the specter of a hike. If people still think a rate hike is coming, then they're not going to get any stimulus out of that. The Fed has to take the rate hikes off the table by saying uh, we're not going to raise rates. But the question is, why aren't they going to raise rates? They don't want to say, well, it's because the economy is much weaker than we thought, because that knocks the legs out of the story that the president is telling. And that's going to hurt Hillary Clinton for the Federal Reserve to peddle fiction. Right. The Federal Reserve wants to still pretend that everything is good. So that's what they've got to figure out. Maybe they're going to blame it on the global economy, even though the U.S. is much weaker than a lot of other countries that are part of that global economy. But still, since everybody somehow believes that the global economy is in so much trouble and America is in much better shape, maybe they can use that uh, to their advantage by coming to the rescue of the global economy, saying, look, the U.S. economy is OK, but since inflation is still really low, forgetting about the fact that it's rising, but since inflation is still really low uh, and the global economy is kind of shaky, we just want to take out some insurance, right? Maybe we just need a booster shot of stimulus or something. But of course, you know, the first thing they can do is just say, look, we're going to halt f- future rate hikes. And they can see, you know, what that does, what, what that little bit of an ease, because that would be the first cut. But, you know, they can't cut much because once they say they're not going to raise, then all, all they can then do is cut. And then they got one cut and they're done, right? They're at zero unless they want to venture into the negative territory, which would be a complete disaster. Now, yes, of course, they could wind up the printing presses and relaunch the QE program, which I think there's a very, very good chance that they're going to do. But, you know, the amazing thing, too, is how few people have really recognized the, the change here. And in fact, nothing has actually changed. The economy has always been weak. I mean, this was a done deal. What should be changing is the perception of investors to reality. Now, what's amazing is that all this bad economic news has been coming out for so long and the markets have been oblivious to it. What I got wrong was assuming that people would have figured it out sooner. But instead, they just ignored what they were seeing in the markets, the economic data that was coming out, and they listened to the Fed. They listened to Janet Yellen. Now, maybe they had a vested interest in in believing all that nonsense, but that's what they did. But now it's becoming more and more obvious based on how rapidly the Federal Reserve of Atlanta and other people were forced to completely take away all the economic growth that they thought was going to happen in the first quarter. And now they're pretending that we're going to get it in the second and third quarter. How much longer can they pretend that that's going to happen? Because I think it's possible, given the dynamics that I've already laid out, that the second quarter is going to be worse than the first quarter. And of course, we won't get the second quarter numbers until July, Now, theoretically, people were looking for the Fed to hike rates in June. There's no chance that they're going to do that. And we get this horrible number in July. The government doesn't have a lot of time. The Federal Reserve doesn't have a lot of time to try to stimulate this economy uh, in time for the November election. That is the conversation that uh, Barack Obama was likely having with Janet Yellen. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall of that room uh, to actually see what's going on because it's happening behind closed doors, right? There's no minutes that are going to be released of these conversations. I mean, yes, maybe we'll get some kind of a statement, an official statement about the meeting, but we're never going to know what was actually said in that meeting because I'm sure that Janet Yellen was part of Team Obama and Team Hillary. This was a political meeting. Right. I mean, they didn't have to meet to discuss the economy. What's there to discuss? They don't have to meet to discuss any of that stuff. It's all about strategy. It's all about what do we do in the face of this rapidly decelerating recovery? If not, we're already in recession. How do we get out of a recession without admitting that we're in it? Because the last thing they want to do is admit we're in a recession because that's an admission that their policies fail. You know, another problematic sign for the market, too, is the fact that we're starting to see a bit of a divergence now between oil prices, which are continuing to go up, and stock prices, 
which are headed south. In fact, the Dow Jones initially this morning had a, had a triple-digit gain and managed to finish down uh, 20 points. Same thing with the Nasdaq. Had a very, very healthy 1% gain in the morning, but it ended up closing down 17 points. Even though oil prices closed back above $40 a barrel, you know, 40, 40 34 now, I'm looking at it up uh, six, 62 cents on the day. But strength in crude did not translate into strength in the stock market. In fact, people are going to start to realize that rising oil prices, among other prices that are also going up, is a net negative for the consumer because he's already broke. He's struggling with a mountain of debt and a low paying job. And to now see oil prices going up instead of going down is going to be a negative for the U.S. economy. So I think this whole idea uh, that what we need is higher oil prices. I was saying for a while when it comes to wishing for higher oil prices, because you think that's going to be good for the economy and good for the stock market, be careful about what you wish for. In fact, at the rate at which our rig count is collapsing, all this uh, oil that we're no longer pumping has to be imported and the trade deficit going higher is also negative for the U.S. economy. One thing, though, that I wanted to uh, talk about, as well, I was watching this discussion on, on CNBC, and it was Henry Blodgett that was talking about the, um, the minimum wage and h- how he thought it was going to I- impact things. And he repeated something that you know is talked about. It's a meme that I hear over and over again, and it, it it bothers me every time I hear it because I know it's not true, but of course that doesn't stop it from being spread. And that's this whole idea about Henry Ford and why he paid his workers as much money as he did. And Blodgett was retelling the story uh, the same way that liberals always like to retell it, was that Henry Ford decided to pay his workers a lot because he wanted to make sure that they could buy his cars. Right. So he wanted to pay his workers enough money so that they can afford his cars. And that's why the economy was so strong, because you had uh, entrepreneurs like Henry Ford who knew that the key to success was a strong middle class. And therefore, you had to pay them more money so they can afford to buy your products. Now, of course, Henry Ford did say that as a press conference. He said, yes, I want my employees to be able to afford to buy my products. But that is not why he gave them raises. That would have been asinine because He would have lost money if you just give your employees money so that they can buy your products. You're not going to benefit from that from that transaction. You know, (laughs) I mean, Henry Ford was a genius. He wasn't an idiot. He invented the production line. He wasn't you know, dumb enough not to be able to do simple math. No, the reason that Henry Ford increased the pay of his workers was because He wanted to reduce the turnover because there was a lot of training. He trained his workers because he came up with a production line. And the production line depended on each person on that line doing their assigned task. And so if somebody quit, it screwed up the whole line. And so uh, Ford, they would train their workers to, to, to know how to do a particular important part of that production process. And they wanted to make sure that they didn't quit and have to train somebody else. And so it was to reduce turnover and therefore increase productivity that Henry Ford paid his workers more money. It wasn't because he was a nice guy and he wanted them to buy their cars. He was looking at the bottom line and he didn't want his employees to quit and have to retrain them. But it was the productivity. It was the productivity of that production line that increased the economic value of those workers, which enabled Henry Ford to pay his workers more money. And of course, in real terms, those Ford workers in 1900, without a minimum wage and without labor unions, earned more money than Ford workers do today. And wasn't even close. Henry Ford paid his workers in real terms much more than Ford pays his workers today. And especially if you want to account for after tax, because there was no income tax back when Henry Ford was paying his workers. There was no Social Security tax either. So whatever Henry Ford paid, his, his workers kept 100 percent of it, unlike today with all the money that's being siphoned off uh, in taxes. But my point is, it wasn't the generosity of Henry Ford. And the key to the success of our economy wasn't high paid workers. High paid workers was the result of the success of our economy. It was the innovation and the rising productivity that led to the rising wages, not government decree. The problem is now 
the government is trying to force feed higher wages down the throats of companies, and it's not going to work. They're going to spit those higher wages back up, and they're going to fire their workers because you can't order companies to pay workers more than their productivity because businesses are still around to make a profit. I'm not going to pay somebody $15 an hour if I lose money in the process. If somebody can produce $10 worth of productivity, how am I going to pay them $15? And again, it's not just 15. That's what the employee gets, although he doesn't get the whole 15 because he pays taxes. But on top of that 15, the employer has to pay his half of Social Security. He's got to pay workman's comp. He's got um, unemployment insurance, whatever. You know, there's all these other costs. And then there's added, you know, potential liability. You know, what if the guy uh, sues me for harassment or discrimination or what if I fire him and I get a wrongful termination? All these costs factor in. $15 $15 an hour, that's just the starting point. Then you got to start building it for there. So by the time it's all in, you know, you're paying a guy $15 an hour, you're looking at maybe $20 an hour cost. So, I mean, that's a pretty high bar. I got to find somebody that can deliver more than $20 an hour of productivity before I take a chance and hire them. You know, the government comes in with $15 an hour. Look, this is going to be very, very difficult for people to get jobs. Uh, people are going to be looking more at automation. They're going to be looking at... At, uh, at at outsourcing or just downsizing, finding more and more ways to avoid employment. So this is night and day compared to Henry Ford paying more productive workers based on the the uh, invention of the production line and all the automation of the the efficiencies that that brought about and how much more productive workers became as part of a assembly line. That's what enabled Henry Ford uh, to pay those workers and all the training. Uh, that went into uh, making those workers more productive. That's why he was able to pay them higher wages. Uh, And it wasn't the higher wages that made the economy grow. It was the growing economy that made possible the higher wages. You can't reverse the process. If a growing economy causes wages to go up, you can't make an economy grow by making wages go up. Logic doesn't work in reverse. What you'll end up doing by artificially forcing wages up, you'll shrink the economy and destroy jobs. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now, I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My goal video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.